Wait, we're not live now, are we? We're going to be live and uh, we're going to be all just chatty. Here's some we're live right now. And then here comes Greg Peterson. Okay, I guess I need to get my chat box open here, don't Melissa I? Murphy. Hi, Greg. Hello there. Oh, Greg. You're muted. Greg's on mute. Greg Peterson. Yeah, hold on. I'm trying to say, okay, it should be off mute now. I'm trying to get my audio to my. Live on Facebook. You got the team and people are rolling in. Okay. And if it's live on Facebook, they can go back and watch it, can't they? They can. And no pressure, but my mom might be on. <laughs> I'm the team comic. My name is Shane. Okay, so, so the question is, is do we have, we need to share, give him admin rights and so he can share his screen. Yep. I will be able to. Um, if you can find it on Facebook. All participants actually. Okay. All right. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Can you share your screen? We're going to let you. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Okay, we should do it. Realtors ready six minutes early. And I'm assuming it's on our team page. So I've got somebody type texting me now. If they want to go back and see it, then they just need to follow SDG and Associates, right? Yep, it's on our team page, it's on the Dozer group, and it's on SDG MVP. It's on all three pages. All right, I have to be right back because I have to allow permissions to share my screen and I got to reopen Zoom real fast. So I'll be right back. Okay. There we go. This is why we logged on early. I know. These sorts of things. And Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Melissa is an early bird. <laughs> Who knows Melissa? Oh, hi, Melissa. Chandra? Yep. Hi. I'm here now. Uh -huh. I'm always early. That's I'm nerdy. Great. <laughs> Karen, are you done? Yep. With your chicken? <laughs> I pushed it to the side since we went on Facebook. So I'm oh, only okay. drinking water. The rest later. Uh, mm -hmm. Me too, with red dye in it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is a good story. I was in Napa my very first time. I went to this amazing restaurant that had these copper cups that made your water so cold. And um, while we were at dinner, I ordered them. And when we came home, they were on our porch. And Dave's like, how did that even happen? It's magic. Like the universe heard that I loved it. <laughs> Bottom. Yep. And here comes Greg again. And okay, here comes Sean. Behave Chris. yourself tonight, Chandra, okay? Can I oh, confess God. something? <laughs> what? I was like, would it be bad if I had a glass of wine in my hand? No, it's yeah, not. it is. It's actually really, I'll really good. I'll get bad. mine. I'll be right back. <laughs> Mine's actually Jefferson's aged bourbon. I'll stick with my lemon bourbon, water for now, but I'll know for next time. I have a red cup. Not red wine, but red cup. <laughs> that All right. Yeah. So it's water. Okay. There's some water in it. I took a class about like 20% uh, dilution rates and how to make amazing craft cocktails and the percentage of water versus, it's actually fascinating when you hear about these people who create these things in their head and they liken it to Mr. Potato Head. Like you just build it on a framework and you substitute lime for grapefruit juice and there's some, it's kind of like baking. I think there's some science in it. Were you able to go in person? Yeah, Lake Quivira. They had a craft cocktail day. It's pretty amazing. Well, we were, yeah, when we were down in Mexico, that we had a, an event that we went to, and we were able to, whoever you were at with your table, we had to make cocktails for those people based upon kind of their, just what they liked in drinks. I mean, we were directed on how to do it, but we were shaking and adding and different. Yeah. It was very, I loved it. Okay, Rose Brooks centered. Uh, and there we go. Greg, can we just test and make sure you're able to share your screen before we get started? Yep. Yeah, I think I'll need to be made the presenter again. I don't have the share button. Oh, okay. yeah, I do. I lied. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Perfect. Can you see that now? 
We can. Yep, yeah, we can. Good deal. Now I just gotta make sure that. So, I so Shannon, when I see when I switch it that way, how do I still get to see the chat box? Hold on, there. Hold on. Hmm. Beth Kaltenberger, here she comes. As long as you're not in full screen on your computer, Yay. you'll be able to click the chat at the bottom and see it on the right hand side. Just to make sure on your guys' screen, you just see the presentation. You're not seeing the Brady Bunch of all you on the right, are you? I no, am. You're up above. I got right. you up above. And I see the participants. I just want to be able to see the chat box. There we go. I see Brady Bunch on the right, but which is fine because it's not really covering up your thing. Okay. I just want to make sure it's like mirroring my screen to everyone. I think I can. Nope. No, I think I think you're um you're good to go. Okay, a couple Kelly more minutes. And we'll start. I'm just What's gonna that? announce them. I'll just I'll just announce them um, until he starts talking. You can make sure they're on the list, Michelle. Yeah, I'm trying. I thought I saw something that said Rose. Yes. Center. Yeah, but that's just put Marla down. Marla. Okay, that's okay. I got it. Marla, Mike. Mm hmm. Got it. That's Marla and Dean. Okay, just, here comes uh, using my word. Oh, Michael. <laughs> it's not really Dean. It's Michael Dean. And here comes another Marla. Mike and Marla. Here we go. Michelle, I have Kelly Glaser. Yep, got that one. There. Melissa Murphy. Oh. Is that our court? Yeah. Okay. Maybe. How do we know a lot of more? A whole bunch more? I don't know. <laughs> uh, there could be Courtney, Brooks' best friend. Okay. Uh, Diana. Here comes a David. And it wouldn't surprise me if we end up having people pipe in. Yeah. Once we've actually started. Yeah, so we'll give we'll, another minute or two. We'll get started. Don't you get Beth? Yep. Okay. And then David. David, is it Dave or David? Well, but if it's David, if it's Kaltenberger, Beth calls him David. Oh, I thought we were talking about Dave. <laughs> well, I don't know. Is <laughs> David? Is it Dave David. Dozer? Who is it? Uh, David Hoffman was invited too. It could be a bunch of Davids. My David is on with me, so he's not watching oh. separate. Okay. Okay, inquiring minds want to know, David, who is it? Okay, well, we'll see. We'll see who all logs on. I had a fairly good group I thought was going to be logging on, but I, again, they I might. I have a whole bunch of people because Mill Valley rescheduled basketball and there's hockey games, so it'll all be recorded, so it'll be good. KU's playing tonight, too. I've heard that from here in the other room. Maybe. Karen, right. you might want to just write it on a piece of paper That's what and I'm I'll doing. write it on slips. Okay. Good idea. So um, when when Greg starts speaking, we'll still be able to see his face and see the, um, the screen at the same time, correct? Mm -hmm. he, he's screen sharing, so. Yeah. Yeah, I should, I think you should be able to. There you go. Now that you're talking, you lit up. Oh. Yeah. And now we have Ed Conroy. Ed is the father of one of my very favorite people, Aaron. Okay. Do you want to get rolling here? Yes. So I, the plan for so the plan for tonight, just so everybody knows, is we were planning on muting everybody just so we kind of cut out the background sounds. But um, whoever can do that, I guess, can do it um, and kind of pay attention to that. Shannon, you want to? Awesome. Um, so for the few people that are on here that don't know everybody, um, and don't know me, my name's Cami, and I'm here with all of our team tonight with SDG and Associates and Keller Williams. And we, you all can wave if you want, but we've got Shannon Dozer, Michelle Harlow, Karen Hill, Chandra Ward, Stephanie Vilhauer, Court Hendrickson, and Brooke Lamoth. So we've got a good group representing our team. And we know we have a lot of people that have asked us if this is being recorded. So whether this is a big crowd tonight or a small one, we're glad for the, you, those of you that are joining us. Because as you might remember, 
Um, if you're here tonight, we're going to put your name in a drawing, and at the end, we're going to select one person or one family to receive a one-year membership to one password, which I know Greg's going to talk to us about here in a little while. About it's a, just a great resource um, online to store your passwords and stay protected. Um, we're we are really excited to share this with you because this is going to be an informative evening about um, security awareness. And we've got the pleasure of someone who is a certified ethical hacker with TD Security, who's going to teach us. And for those of you that don't know what TD Security is, I didn't even really know um, specifically. I looked up and looked at their website. They are a company that's a professional services um, company that specializes in financial institutions. And of course, we all want to know that our banks are safe. But I will tell you, because I've already done this with Greg before, don't ask him which banks are safe and not safe because he won't tell you. Um, client privilege. <laughs> uh, we certainly don't need to know that. Anyway, just assume, I guess, your bank is safe. Greg, you can pipe in on that later. But um, Greg, is a, Greg is a past client. And while he was in the process of uh, purchasing his home is when we had this discussion on um, all the things that we should know about for being safe. And I will say, as he's talking, I mean, my brain is going and I'm thinking of questions and I'm asking and all of a sudden I'm realizing that I'm just not very safe. In fact, I actually, these are my passwords. This is how I keep them. It's on a piece of paper. It's, you can go ahead and shame me now if you want, Greg, but it's gonna change. I signed up for one password. Um, so let's, we're gonna go ahead and get started. There's a chat box over there. So if anybody has questions that are relative to what he's speaking on um, at the moment, please type them in there and I will get those questions to Greg. Otherwise we can wait till the end when he's done and um, we'll ask questions then. Also we're taking notes. So if you're just home watching on the couch and you're drinking wine like Michelle or water like Shannon, I, that's what she says, then just sit down and just relax and watch this and um, you don't have to do anything. You, you'll get the notes here by email in a, in a few days. And I think that's it. So um, as your TD security quote Indeed. says on your website, it says, keep your institution off the evening news. Yes. And so I guess that means that we don't wanna find ourselves you know, in a position where some night we're watching the news only to find out that somewhere someplace who has our information has been breached and now we are too. So fire away. It's up to you, Greg. All right. Uh, thanks, Cammie. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Greg Peterson. I am a certified ethical hacker that works at Tendi Security. Um, skip, click here. So just why you should trust me. Uh, I've been in the IT field now for over a decade. Um, all here in Kansas City. Uh, when I graduated, I started at Fishnet Security, which was, of course, founded by Gary Fish, who is, of course, from Kansas City as well. Um, really kind of put me through my paces and really trained me to be where I'm at now. Um, while I was there, I worked with Fortune 100 companies on their firewall network security appliances. Uh, one of my clients I saw pretty much daily was a Fortune 10 company. Um, so that really ran me through my paces and put me where I am today. Uh, now I'm at Tendi Security. I've been there for seven years. My role there is security engineer and penetration tester. Um, that means that I, um, in addition to running vulnerability scans and helping um, institutions set up good configuration and policies for security, I also do live demonstrations where we uh, simulate a malicious attacker going after their networks. Um, since we do work primarily with financial, uh, you could say our job is essentially to rob banks every week. We do physical penetration testing as well. So we will try to sneak into locations, uh, get to places where we're not supposed to be. And then of course, we're doing social engineering, trying to get people to click on malicious payloads, uh, obtain their passwords or get them to uh, run anything that could compromise their systems. We are working with other institutions. It's not just financial. They are a regulated industry though. They are one of the very few industries that are re regulated to do security testing like this. So kind of a scary thought to think about. Um, we're, we're getting better, but we're not quite where we need to be really as a uh, business sector. My company, Tendi Security, was founded in Lenexa. We're now based in Overland Park. They've been in existence for over 15 years. They've been locally owned the entire time. Um, we do have free we weekly security tips. These are geared more towards the enterprise, but there's some really good stuff on there for just homeowners or just anybody on there as well. And of course, it helps us get our name out there. So I put that link in there and I'm sure, uh, Cammie, you'll be able to distribute that after the presentation as well. You will. All right. So 
This is really gonna be a talk over security awareness. Um, like Cammie mentioned, we had a discussion when I was buying a home with her and just, I've always been asked by friends and families, you know, hey, am I doing things right? Or what do I need to do better? And I've noticed that oftentimes there's, I don't wanna say shame, but people are almost afraid to ask these questions. And I think it's important to get the information out there so everybody can better protect themselves. I think we get a lot of this at work when we have to go through our regular, regular HR training and security is kind of tacked on to that sometimes. I think that's easy to gloss over. So that's why I definitely jumped at this when Cami asked me to uh, present to everybody. So the first thing is, is what is security awareness? Um, security awareness in a broad term is how you carry yourself in regards to physical and informational assets, be it organizational or personal. Um, it does not take technical skills to practice and improve your security awareness. Um, and security as a whole is often referred to as an onion because every layer that you add or everything that you start to do is going to help you improve your overall security posture. And this goes for work and at home as well. Um, why do I need to be security aware? I actually had someone, when I was talking to them about good security policy, ask me why. Why is it important for me to do this at home? And it, it kind of took me back and, and realized I have the luxury of speaking from this, doing it as a career. And I, I know what the consequences are. And maybe a lot of us don't. You know, we, we obviously know the, the immediate ones, your bank account could get broken into, uh, your personal information. But uh, one thing to consider is last, not last year now, sorry, in 2019, um, the amount of data breaches resulted in 164 million uh, sensitive records being exposed. And that was over 1,400 breaches. In the first half of 2020, so last year, there had already been 540. Um, breaches happen all the time, but they can range in severity. And a lot of times I, when I talk to my family, I'll be like, hey, did you hear about the breach? You know, make sure you change your stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, but they didn't get any credit cards. And I'm kind of, and that's where I noticed there was a disconnect of, of what we should consider important when a breach occurs. So um, first and foremost, um, why we should be security aware is to pr protect ourselves. So financial assets, like I mentioned, and then PII, that personal identifiable information. And then of course your privacy. If someone gets on your computer or your phone, there's probably some stuff on there that you might not want to have ac access to, uh, any kind of you know family records or anything like that. Also, there is a need for us to protect our family and friends. If someone gets into your email, they're going to attack everybody in that inbox. That's the first thing attackers are going to do is try to spread out and infect more people. Uh, you could give up people's physical addresses as well as their phone number, which can increase the spam likelihood. So there's also um, the main concern is, of course, for your personal protection, but also it's protecting the ones around you is why security awareness pays off. So this Next two slides is going to kind of go over what breaches look like. So um, I, I had to be careful what I was going to show here. Uh, this is actually a dark web website. This is called Dehash. Dehash list dumps, and you can pay them money to see everything. That is my Zynga account. I'm pretty sure when me and my wife started dating, she made me sign up for Farmville so I could help her in Farmville. Um, I have never used that account since in over a decade. But it, all the information is up on that website from when I used that account. This is how the hackers make money with your personal identifiable information. Now, if they don't get your credit card, they'll sell your email address, your physical address, your uh, name, full name, any kind of security questions. When you're notified of a breach that happened to a company that you do business with or you know a social media website that you use, you need to consider what could have been taken. Anything urgent, the big ones are social security, credit card numbers, and passwords. Those are the big, oh crap, immediate action needs to happen. But then you need to think of things like, um, was there any security questions that were exposed? Was my email address exposed? What email address did I use for that? Was that my work email address? If your work email address was exposed in a breach, you need to let your, your business know because they're going to have an increased amount of spam emails that are going to come into them once your information gets up on these uh, breach websites. Um, so those are the things you really need to consider when you're notified of a breach. So here's also another website to show you what this looks like. This is where I can buy people's account information right here. So eBay, Chase.com, Citibank, Navy Federal, Target. Uh, you can see the prices. Um, prices are often how recent the uh, breach was. 
Um, a lot of times there'll be accounts that are confirmed bad. They don't work anymore, but people still buy the information. So they get a view into what your password looked like at that time and they get your email address. So um, it, it's not just your bank accounts that the bad guys can make money off of. Um, they have found a way to monetize pretty much everything. So the other big thing I'm always asked is people have a firm grasp of what they're at risk to with their business. But they always ask me, what am I really at risk to at home? And again, that was a really interesting question to me. So I, I really thought about it when writing this slide. And I came up with three major things that I think of most people at home would be at risk to. The first one is social engineering. And that's the spam emails that we always get. Hey, ma'am or mister, I would, I'm working on an important business and I need your help with your bank account to hold this money while I'm, I'm waiting to join the United States. You know. We're, we've all gotten those emails. That is the most common way that um, people's identity are compromised, their accounts are compromised, or their machines are compromised. Technical accounts, uh, excuse me, attacks are the other one. So this would be brute forcing. And brute forcing is, let's say I try to use uh, Cammy's login to the Keller Williams website, and I have her username. And then I write a script that just tries over and over and over again to log in with her account name eventually discovering a password. Um, there's a lot of protections that happen on the technical side that I won't go into that prevents that. But this is where, when I'm gonna get into strong passwords, this is where you really counteract a lot of these brute forcing style attacks. Um, a big one that I do almost every week on my penetration test is if your company or you use it at home, um, Outlook Web Access or Office 365, I spray those portals every week. Um, they're publicly exposed portals. If someone's using a weak password, I'm gonna be able to get into those email accounts if they're not using multi-factor authentication, which I'll get in as well. Um, excuse me. The other big one is rogue authentication portals. So this would be an attacker sets up a fake, uh, let's say Target webpage. It looks 100% like Target. They send you a, a coupon email, you know, click here for free $50 at Target. Uh, you gotta log into your account first to, to get the coupon. You click on it, it takes you to a Target login screen. You enter your credential and now the attacker has your credentials. That is one of the most common ways uh, credentials are stolen. Um, we use that similar style of attack in, in our um, procedures at my company as well. Um, and then the third one in the technical is vulnerable smart systems or devices in our home. So it used to be the router. Where, you know, we always heard, make sure your router's up to date, make sure you have a good password on your router. Well, now it's your Alexa, your doorbell, your garage door opener, your smart microwave. If you put it on the internet, you really got to think of it as a, almost a door into your house at this point. The last one is third party victim from a breach. Um, so if a company's information is exposed and you were a part of that breach, you are now at risk to the ramifications of that breach. So those are the three main ones. And before I progress too much, I do want to say this presentation is not a scare tactic to make anyone feel like they can't participate in um, smart systems and using your account. It's really to educate you to minimize these risks. Um, that's the important thing. Like I said, security is that onion and every little thing that you add to what you're doing helps you greatly reduce the ramifications as well as mitigate being exposed to these types of activity. So Greg, I do have, I do have one question about the social engineering. Of course. When somebody gets an email that we typically just laugh at and delete, is deleting mm -hmm. it enough or is there something else we should be doing with those? I encourage you highly to check in with uh, HR or IT and ask them what they want you to do. A lot of places I work with now have an email address that they encourage their users to forward those emails to. So IT can uh, inspect them, pull some important information out of who it came from, what IP address, get those blocked, um, and then they handle the deletion. So I, I really check with your business um, what they prefer you do with it. Okay. And, and then at home, of course, just yeah. delete it. Delete, okay. Yep. So one thing I wanted I to talk, go ahead. Um, before you delete it, if your mail um, service has it, should you do the red flag thing and then delete it? Mm -hmm. Anything where you can submit it for them to review or flag it as malicious, um, definitely do that first. Um, it, it, it depends on who your ISP is. You'd have to check with them. Um, but yeah, if you have anything that's letting you flag it, definitely do so. Greg, when you said, mm -hmm. Um, I spray those portals every week. What does that mean? Okay. Yep. Sorry. You guys will have to do this a lot. <laughs> I, I'm going to go um, too technical sometimes and that's fine. So password spraying is 
I make a password list. So let's say Mahomes 2021, Chiefs 2021, Royals 2021. I feed that to a script that I create that just sits there and logs into Outlook Web Access. Like it just goes and goes and goes. Um, I usually do it one password every two hours so I don't lock out people's accounts. Um, that way I kind of stay stealthy, but that's what password spraying is. It's an attacker who just sprays a bunch of passwords at a login portal essentially, so. Yep. So if you've set yours to Mahomes Rocks 2021, and that's something you sprayed, you all of a sudden have access to my stuff is what you're saying. Correct, yeah. Yeah, we use a bunch of different scripts. Um, when you log on to a website without getting too technical, it gives feedback that we can just write a script to tell if the password worked. And then we just go to the website and log in and we're in. Wow. Yep, so it, there's a lot of things stacked against you. That's why when I'm covering these, anything that you can do here is just gonna help you prevent that so much. And a big reason why is, is like this slide says, all of this can kind of snowball. We all think about the immediate risk. They got my credit card, dang, I need to call my credit card company. Here's where it can get really bad. When attacker gets a valid credential, they're going to immediately try that password at every website you can think that's of, a, of significance. Amazon, Netflix, banks, et cetera. If you're using the same password and it gets compromised, you need to consider basically every website you use that password at compromised as well because attackers are fast and they have tools that will automate doing that. Um, your social media account, um, if you are uh, breached, um, the, the first thing a smart attacker is going to do if, if they're manually doing this is go look at your Facebook or your Twitter or your LinkedIn. They're going to try to figure out where you bank, where you work, where you shop, what you're into, because that will give them targets in terms of where you're likely to have uh, valuable assets or account information. Um, and that's why I put here, password reuse is one of the least secure things you can do. There'll be two things that I say, if you take anything from this presentation, it's don't do password reuse, which is using the same password at multiple sites and to use two-factor authentication, which is gonna come up later. Um, and then the big thing, like I said, malicious tools makes it easy to automate all of this. Um, and attackers are fast. They have the tools ready to go. They're going to plug in your password and, and shoot it at those websites as soon as they can. So I wanted to add some quick notes on social media. Uh, Cami mentioned it as a, as a good topic um, to kind of bring up. The best things you can really do, if you're not a public figure, just set your account to only be viewed by friends and family. Um, that's a really good way to prevent that kind of exposure. Uh, just be mindful what you post. Uh, your, your post can give clues about passwords. Like I said, if I went to someone's Facebook and saw they retweet or reshared a lot of chief stuff and you know they're pumped for the Super Bowl, there's the passwords I'm going to put first in my uh, script that's going to try to automate logins. So you can kind of see where this goes. I, if your account is public and you post your email address or physical address, uh, you need to basically consider it's on the spam list now. Uh, there's just a lot of scripts that crawl post. And by crawl, I mean, there's, there's uh, tools that will just sit there and go through the internet and record it as text and then pull out email addresses, physical addresses. So if you share any of that publicly, you, you need to basically consider it's, it's on a spam list now, which isn't the end of the world because all our emails are on spam list by now. Right. So if our emails were on Facebook and, you know, in the about section, then it's kind of too late to go back and get rid of it, most likely. Yeah. And like for you as a public figure at Keller Williams, like if I Google searched email and then quoted at KellerWilliams.com, whatever your email domain is, I would instantly get all of you in a, in a text document that I could pull down to start emailing. So, yeah, so it, go ahead. You have any public facing. So like if you want a, for example, um, when we list a house, Mm -hmm. friends and family want to share that post, you have to make it public. Correct. Yeah. And one of the big things with security, and I was going to touch on this a little bit, you can't be perfectly secure because then nothing's going to be usable. Um, and it, it's all about understanding the risk and making informed decisions to mitigate them to the best of your ability. Um, a big thing we talk about with our clients is some risks have to be accepted for you to function. Um, it, and that gets into that. Like, you have to put your email address out there so clients can contact you, so referrals can get a hold of you. That's, a, that's an accepted risk. But at the same time, you need to understand that I have a public email address at Keller Williams. I need to be more mindful about spam because my email address is shared. Whereas let's say someone may be on the HR side of things in payroll, their email address 
probably isn't out all, all over Facebook. So, so should if you are, uh, Cami and I are using our Keller Williams email for business, mm -hmm. should be using my Gmail or some other email for other things that might. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely yeah. would. Yeah, I when I talk to clients and um, when I'm doing research for social engineering campaigns, I get a lot of information about people because they reuse their work email address for personal stuff. Um, one institution I got in, they had two gentlemen that were part of a golf club and I pretended to be the golf club and asked them about their membership dues, created a fake portal, got their password. It was the same password they used for the work email and I was in. Um, so that's why I say, yes, that separation is important. Work email address used for work, personal used for personal. Um, that's a good way to really protect yourself. I have another question. Of course. Uh, okay, so like, let's say in their case, they have their Keller Williams. Uh, what if they were to set up a Gmail and do the setting where they could have their email forwarded to that Gmail and they can respond back to like you can have a choice of whatever email address that it's coming into respond back you're doing it through gmail but it's responding is that safer it's safer but it also has some inherent risks um when you email someone what's actually going on in the background is is a lot of technical information and we can look at the raw email which is just the the text, it's not the formatted, and it will show all the headers of where the email originated from and how it eventually ended up to me. So I'll be able to see that it started from Gmail's email servers. So there's a little more risk that they'll be able to tell that you're forwarding. I don't believe off the top of my head, I'm gonna see your forwarding address, which is the original Gmail address. So yes, it's a lot more secure to do it that way, but no, at the same time, it also is gonna show that it originated from Gmail, so. All right. Um, and like I said, a, a quick tip for if you do have to shoot someone, hey, you know, they're mailing you something, just always do it in direct messaging. Um, don't post it in their wall or as a reply. Um, so where do I start being more secure? Uh, that's also one of the most common questions I get asked. Hey, where do I start? What would you be doing if you were me? Password management. It, it is... Um, it's almost a catch-22 we've put ourselves in. The best way to be more secure is have strong passwords, but if you have strong passwords for every single account that you have, you're never gonna be able to remember your passwords and not be able to do anything. So that's where password management tools come in handy. They add some more work for sure, but security, like I said, it, it's a constant adjustment of being absolutely secure means you can't use anything, but then you have usability and ease of use as well. And password management kind of sits in the middle. It increases your security, um, but it, it, it does take a, a little bit away from usability if you're using you know, the same password everywhere. But this trade-off is very much worth it. Um, the first thing to consider is how are you creating your passwords or passphrase? I've said that one time to a friend and he said, what is a passphrase? And so I have to remember that a lot of people don't get the education that I had to even realize most accounts nowadays, you can use a passphrase. So on the next uh, two points here, what is a strong password? So the first one there, Royals 2021, this is a weak, easy, guessable, and quickly cracked password. Cracking passwords is, um, so your password's stored in a hash. Um, without getting too technical, that's an equation that essentially obfuscates your password so it's not stored in clear text. We, when we crack passwords, we're essentially using a computer to go through every hash possibility until it matches. And then when it's a match, it looks to see which word it was when it created the hash and boom, there's your password. Um, this has drastically uh, increased in efficiency. Um, some, something you might be familiar with is uh, crypto mining. Um, so basically, Crypto miners use graphic cards to quickly process when they're, when they're doing the crypto mining. That's hashing, it's the exact same concept. With the changes that they've made with graphic card infrastructure, uh, technology, sorry, um, it, crash, uh, passing crack words is trivial for us. If you use Royal 2021 and I got your password hash um, with a standard Windows, how they store your password hash, it would be cracked in 20 minutes, if not less. Um, it, it is that efficient now. Um, and that's why the strength is, is incredibly uh, important. 
So the next one here is a password phrase, which a lot of places let you use phrases now. Uh, the Royals are my favorite baseball team in 2021 with some random capitals and an exclamation point. And when we crack, words. yeah, and space is the huge part. When we crack passwords, they're taking a list of words and hashing them and then checking to see if it's a match. Um, that's how most crack, cracking and passwords work. If you add spaces, that nearly, the math is insane. Like you can think about when you square and, and uh, like values, how quickly they multiply. Same thing here. Every time you add a space that nearly infinitely increases the possibilities of what your password could be and how long it's going to take to crack. So this is obviously a much more secure password. I always recommend to people, hey, if I don't have my password manager or buy me and I need to make a password real quick, what should I do? I say, make a phrase and get it changed when you can. Um, so that's uh, one way to really uh, just improve your security posture now is use phrases. Um, I'm gonna kept, touch on this in a little bit. Phrases are great for um, your password manager's password as well, because you do have to set a password on that or it kind of defeats the purpose. It's it's Cami not to pick on you, but your piece of paper then essentially, because anybody can view it. So um, how do you use storing passwords? That's the other thing. And again, the writing on the notepads, you have to consider that open information. Um, when we do physical penetration tests, um, it, it's been in my seven years there, probably close to 20 times I've found people with the sticky note password under their keyboard, under their monitor. Um, it's, it happens, it still happens at work and it, it's, it's not a good thing. Um, that's what social engineers rely on, uh, betrayal of trust, getting inside institutions and finding that information. Um, another thing, and, and Cami, you had a, I mean, you had talked about this, is do you change your password at regular intervals? And does this matter? Um, if your password is strong and is stolen, the hashed value, attackers are gonna to work to crack that offline. And if it is a strong password, it's gonna take months. Um, but if you haven't changed your password, once it's exposed, it, it's of no value because they've cracked that password. Um, this is really um, something to do once you've established all the other uh, layers of the onion, let's say, but it's something that just really ups the um, advantages in your favor um, if you were being targeted. If you're changing your password once a year, that, that really does go a long way. Um, and, it, and it's something to consider. Um, and like I said, it, it just reduces the risk that if your hashed password was stolen, when the attacker comes back after it cracks, it's not gonna work. Um, this is really important for your Wi-Fi devices. Um, stealing people's Wi-Fi is very popular, especially if you live in more dense areas. Um, so it, it's a big concern there and something I do pretty regularly. Uh, Netflix too. Netflix are very popular to crack passwords for to try and log into. So I think me and my wife change ours about every six months. All right. So how can I store these passwords? What are password management applications that I keep talking about? The three big ones and the ones that I've used personally, these are the three biggest. It's LastPass, KeyPass, and 1Password. Others exist. I don't have personal experience with them, so I'm not going to mention them. I'm, I only mention products I've actually used. Um, how they differ, KeyPass is arguably the most secure just because it's offline. You store your database fi uh, file locally. You are responsible for it. A lot of people put it in Google Drive or iCloud, so it's essentially cloud accessible. Um, it does require a higher technical skill uh, just because it is a bit more involved. Um, the other benefits are it's, it's free and open source. So open source means it's essentially community developed. Um, open source projects usually get quite a bit of updates a lot faster than um, a commercial product. Um, LastPass is kind of the nice middle ground. It has both a paid and free version. Um, it has a broad range of features, whereas KeyPass is really just for passwords. Um, LastPass uh, also works with a lot of browser extensions, which is really nice. And I'm gonna walk you through a demo of that, how it can really make this a lot more manageable than you think. Um, the last one is the one I personally use now. I, I love LastPass. It is paid only, which is it's, it's not. It is so robust. It has so many things you can think of to help you protect not just your passwords, but credit cards, et cetera. It offers a family plan, which makes uh, sharing your Netflix password super easy. Um, and it focuses on ease of use. And I, 
they have great guides on their website for getting started. They have, when you pay for it, you get customer support. So you can contact them. They're very helpful. Um, it's the one I recommend to most people. If I immediately get a little pushback on paying I, I, and you don't want to pay, LastPass is the one I consider. And then if you consider yourself a little techie and don't like the idea of it being cloud stored, then KeePass is the one for you. So Greg, let me just clarify. Mm -hmm. One password is the, the one you highly recommend. Yes, that's the one I recommend to, for most people. One password. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So I'm going to walk through one password. So there's a, a lot that's already happened here. You do need a, a one password account. Uh, one password accounts are very secure. When you create a new account, you not only need your password, there's a key certificate inside your account that you're going to have to use every single time you, you uh, first set up LastPass on another device. It's a little extra work, but it just goes a long way to keeping uh, everything protected. So I wanted to point out here on the left. So this is after I've set up my LastPass account, or excuse me, one password account. I've logged in to the application. This is running on Mac. It, it essentially looks the same on Windows and on your phone, it, it looks like an application. So this is a lot more condensed. But you can see on the left here, everything that it can store for you. One of the best features I love is the secure notes. So if I'm at the doctor's office and I need to write down some information, but it, it's moderately secure, it's medical information, I put it in a secure note, then it is protected behind everything else that my password uh, manager um, sets up for security. You can store credit cards. Um, if you wanna have uh, your credit card number easily available when you're, you're shopping online, and I'm gonna cover this later in the, in the discussion as well, it's right there. I don't personally use the credit card in the bank account feature, but, it's, it's better than storing it on a text document by your computer. Um, database, I won't get into that, that's kind of technical. Driver's license, if you're in a, um, in a situation where you have to give copies of your driver's license often, I'm not really sure what that would be, but it can let you store a digital copy of your driver's license there, which is very helpful. Email accounts, memberships. So if you have a membership to uh, you know, Top Golf or something like that, you can store a digital copy of it. it they have everything to not to ramble on. So I'm going to walk you through, uh, I set up an account for the Keller Williams website. Don't worry, I didn't hack you guys and actually make an account on your, on your, <laughs> your portal there. I was just using it to kind of show what this looks like. So the first thing I'm going to do is set up a username, Greg KW for Keller Williams. And then you can see here that this is the interface that, last, uh, that one password brings up. And I just set it to random password that's 24 characters with symbols and numbers. So it took care of creating that password for me. Right below this password box is actually the website. So that's very important. This is how LastPass works automatically, is to make sure you have the URL, which uh, is the, um, e the web address for the website that you're logging onto, saved in, in uh, 1Password as well. That's how it kind of handles knowing when you're at that website. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like now that I've saved that. So when logged into 1Password, um, the autofill menus will appear for save web websites and applications. So this is me on the Keller Williams website in the login section now. And you can see I've just put my mouse cursor and username and one password has already popped up a little box right there. I click on that and what's going to happen is it automatically enters my credentials and I'm ready to log in. Um, and I'm not sure we're actually seeing the one password symbol on our screen. Maybe other people are, but I know what you're talking about because I've created it. Yes, that's a good point. It, it'll show the little blue and white. It almost looks like a bullseye sign, I guess. It, it's a lock. Which, so, when you, yeah. so when you see that one password symbol, mm -hmm. step back again, tell me again. So I go, to, I go to a website, I'm getting ready to log in, and it knows to pop up that little round symbol. What Correct, do we do? yep. Um, so to get that functionality, you will need to have it installed and then the browser extension installed as well. So LastPass and 1Password work through browser extensions. Um, the 1Password website's great for walking you through how to do that. So essentially, uh, if you've ever done an add-on with Chrome, you're essentially installing an add-on to Chrome to get this functionality. When you set up 1Password for the first time, it, it, it'll pop up, do you wanna add this, your extension to your browser? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there's my screenshots bad here. There is a little white and blue, it's a lock, kind of looks like a bullseye you click on if you're not logged in to log into 1Password and then you'll have all this functionality. Um, so obviously this is a lot easier than managing a ton of passwords. If you're logged into 1Password, that's one account that it's very important to remember, but then you have instant access to all your other passwords and it lets you set unique, strong passwords for every account you use, um, which is um, 
infinitely more secure than any other option out there. The only uh, more secure option is memorizing strong, secure, mm. unique passwords, which I can't even do. Um, this really does kind of solve that problem. So that was not so bad. Um, that's really the extent of what I use 1Password for. Like I said, there's a lot of different features that you might find a need for. For me, this is all about managing my account securely. It's also taking away the stress of helping uh, my friends and family who aren't as technical as me um, get to a place where they are more secure. A quick tip, um, I have an iPhone. Uh, my iPhone is locked behind uh, my face ID. It's pretty secure. Um, I store my 1Pass password inside my Apple keychain, which is Apple's password management, essentially. Um, I don't like to have all my eggs in one basket to, to kind of say that. I like the fact that even if you get inside my phone, you then have to get inside my 1Password to get my accounts. So nothing against Apple Keychain. I just like that extra layer. So again, remember, we're layering on top to make a security onion. So that's kind of my point here. This is just one layer. So now that you've done this, this is good. You are way more secure than you were before you started doing this, which is great. But we still have some more options to us, which really aren't that hard to manage. So this is the big one. Outside of using a password manager, when people ask me, hey, what's the most important thing for me to do? If I mention a password manager and they say, oh yeah, I'm already using LastPass, I'm already using KeePass, I go, great. Have you set up multi-factor or two-factor authentication for every account that you can? That's when I usually get a lot of blank looks. So multi-factor and two-factor authentication is probably the security feature that stops me dead in my tracks on penetration tests the most. Um, so it is essentially another piece of information that an attacker um, needs to compromise your account. And most importantly, it's something else that you have to provide when you log on to your account. So the biggest thing is with multi-factor and two-factor authentication, and they're kind of used interchangeably, even though they are diff technically different, they need to come from different areas. Um, and I'm gonna cover that in a bit. Um, it's something you know, which is a password or a PIN number. If you have two passwords or a password and a PIN, technically not multi-factor authentication and it's something you wanna avoid. Don't consider yourself more secure at that point. Yes, it's technically better, but they both can be compromised in the same way. Social engineering, clicking the wrong thing, entering your credentials, getting it in clear text. Something you have, is a key card, like a fob to get inside a building or a token. Um, these were more commonly, I'd say in the early 2000s represented by a USB device that you would plug into your computer or have with you and it would just randomly have like six digits on it that would change. Um, nowadays that's handled a lot through authentic authenticator apps, which I'm gonna cover in detail. And then last is something you are. This is fingerprints, this is face ID. Touch ID, face ID, I forget what Samsung calls it, this is, a, that's essentially two-factor authentication for your phone. So your phone, you have to have your number or password you enter, and then you have to provide your face or your fingerprint. Use these as much as you can. I get there's people with concerns about biometric data and providing that. 100% if that's not for you, remember we talked about that accepting risk. Sometimes we have to do what's most comfortable for us. Try to use token, something you have instead. Um, it's now the norm for most applications to offer multi-factor and two-factor. Something crazy to consider, and I could be wrong on my dates, I'm pretty sure Amazon didn't offer two-factor authentication until like three years. Like they were way late to the game. Um, I immediately write companies if they don't offer multi-factor authentication, and it has actually prevented me from using services in the past. So it's kind of a big deal. It's getting better. Um, most places uh, offer it, you go to your account settings and where it has sign-in security, sometimes it's under privacy. If you see something that says set up alternative authentication, set up multi-factor authentication or set up two-factor authentication, that's where you go. And of course, feel free to contact their support staff. That's what they're there for. Um, and they can help you find that. So, so Greg, go um, ahead. Is there, would you recommend, so I have, I switched over to Mac, right? Mm -hmm. And my Mac has my finger and all the whole, do you find that that's better than PC? I mean, are, are they safer as far as, are, do hackers hack into your extra laptop? I, I mean, talk, talk about that. Of course, yeah, they use similar technologies. Um, I, I'd say the biggest concern with biometric data is privacy. Um, Apple, I'm gonna speak to Apple because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm more familiar with them. They have made it a point to 
be very secure with your privacy. Um, Apple currently does not sell data for monetary value. Um, they have not ever. Um, Windows also in their terms of use says they are not using the biometric data for, for selling your information. So that's an important thing to look for if you're concerned about privacy is what are they doing with that information? They have to publicly post and tell you what they do with it. Um, it is more secure because with the exception of very few things, when Face ID first came out, I remember it was, you could buy these masks to get through it, but it, it's hard for someone else to get a hold of your face or your fingerprint. It's, it is, it's hard to replicate those. Um, uh, Windows does have it. They have a little fingerprint scanner on like the surfaces now. Most companies do offer some kind of biometric. It is the most secure two-factor you can use. Um, it's not offered everywhere. We can't really easily give a fingerprint to Amazon when we're shopping though. Um, I personally use Face ID. I use Touch ID on my Mac um, as well. Um, it, I do recommend it to answer your question. Yes, it, it, it greatly increases your security posture. So, um, but like I said, I am sensitive to people's privacy concerns and I know it's not for everyone. It used to be, I feel like Max didn't get the viruses and all the stuff. And like we currently, Brooke has on our team, we have a, you know, a non-Mac and a Mac or whatever, because Mac's more yes. expensive. So that's a great point. Um, that's a common misconception, but it, it, Macs don't have less vulnerabilities. They have less targets. Um, so Macs has a lower consumer share than Windows. Uh, Windows is the most popular operating system in corporate roles. So it makes sense for an attacker to target Windows systems. Um, iOS and Mac both this week just patched. iOS had three major vulnerabilities that were being exploited in the wild. Um, so those numbers are actually easing up a bit. Um, the way Apple's work it's a little harder to get malicious code on there, but you got to keep the guards up no matter what. Um, Apple does do a better job in the sense that it's a closed ecosystem. Um, they only let Apple uh, make Apple computers, whereas Microsoft, you know, lets they're more open and let multiple vendors do that. Um, so there's more components, um, but. Sorry, I can ramble on sometimes when talking no, I just about that. Curious, I mean, I know you watch, if you yeah. watch too much TV, you'll see they're like hacking into people's computers. Yeah. And then all of my passwords are saved on my computer, right? Because mm -hmm. I actually, I don't save any, right? I mean, I don't not save any of my passwords on my computer. So if you have yeah. my computer, you can shop at Nordstrom all day long, right? So that's the great thing about one pass or last pass or key pass. If they get on your computer and you're using one of those, they then have to get inside your one pass, your key pass and your last pass, which is, that's the real benefit there. Cause a lot of people store it. I've come across plenty of passwords in an Excel, Excel database um, on their machine. So. On that, so on that one password, I know you're mm -hmm. creating a password or a strong password or a passphrase. It's just the one you have to remember because that gets you into that. But yes. if you you enter your other information, like even as an example, let's say I've got, um, well, I'll just use Netflix as an example. So you have Netflix, then do you put in the, are you entering the password that you've used previously or do you let it generate just a long, strong one? Cause it doesn't matter because you're gonna be using one password. I would, if you start to use a password database I would go through all your most used and most important accounts. So bank accounts, Netflix, uh, rewards with a ton of rewards points on them, go change those and use a 20 plus character pre-generated password that one, that one password makes for you. Because I mentioned how- Remember it and I don't have to. Yeah, it'll remember it for you. You can always reset it if something happens. Um, and then once you get that set up, go turn on two-factor, which I'm gonna touch on here. But yeah, if you use a password manager, you're really only gonna need to remember that, that one password to get inside your password manager. Hmm. Um, so the most common ways people handle multi-factor is um, these uh, three of them in a list here, and this is outside of uh, biometric. So uh, email and SMS based. Uh, Cami, I spoke with you a little bit about this. A lot of people use this and don't know this actually is the lowest security benefit. And when we do internal audits for uh, companies, we basically consider this to not even be a security benefit. Um, the reason is, and again, this is a not meant to shame anybody who's using it, it's meant to educate. And a lot of times they don't even offer anything but email or SMS based, um, which isn't great. So the problem is email and so uh, SMS messaging, which is text messaging, are really susceptible to social engineering. So if your account is hacked and someone gets your password and you're using one of these for multi-factor, 
if they have access to your email account already, they're, they're going to see the codes come in. And same thing with SMS. It's acceptable to shoulder, uh, shoulder surfing, someone standing behind you. It also really opens you up to um, spear phishing or spear text, where they pretend to be your authentication coming through your multi-factor and say, click here to finalize login. And if you're logging on to Chase Bank and it's like Chase Bank authentication code, did you try to log on? Click here to finish. And it takes you to a fake Chase portal and you log on. They have everything they need now. Um, so that is um, the, and I forgot to mention, so they'll do that. And then they'll also have the box for you to give them the real authentication code as it comes on when you log on to Chase. So they have a lot of tricks to get around that. And that's why I really don't rec recommend it. The next one is push notification. So where most people have probably seen this is with uh, work with your Microsoft Office 365 or with your Apple device. Um, if you're logging on to uh, iCloud on your computer, you might get the thing that pops up on your phone that says, hey, are you trying to log on right now? Here's a code to put on the logon screen. That's a push notification. Those are better, but here's the problem with social engineering, and this has happened multiple times. I have gotten people's password, and on, on Windows, it just pops up and say, hey, are you trying to log on? Someone's trying to log on from Overland Park, and you click yes. Um, I've just sat there and logged on, and they eventually click yes, and I'm in their account. That has happened multiple times. So that is the problem with that style is that if you can socially engineer, or in this case, I guess, just annoy someone to think it's an error and they need to re-log on, they can potentially let you inside their account or you can potentially let them inside. So that's the problem with push notification. It is a little more secure than email or SMS. I would definitely use that over one of those if app-based is not allowed. Um, so application-based, and this is the one I'm going to walk through. This one offers higher uh, security benefit, but has more setup, obviously. The three most common apps are Authy, um, which is what I used. It's, you can just search it by that name in the app stores. Google Two-Factor Authenticator. I like Google a lot, but it doesn't do syncing between devices. And if you get a new phone and forget to back up your Google Authenticator, you get to go reset all your two-factor codes. So that's the problem with that one. Uh, multi, uh, Microsoft has one for well uh, as well. It's really meant for their Azure platform and their Office 365, but it is a really good app if you have it set up right to also do the code. So how to use these apps. Um, the first thing you do is you download them to your phone. Um, they're primarily used to replace the old tokens that I said look like little USB sticks with the numbers on them. That's really what you're replacing when you use an app, a uh, multi-factor authentication tool. Um, I use Authy because it syncs across all my devices, which means you will need to make an account first. Again, make sure you're setting a strong password there. Uh, Authy also has two-factor to get inside Authy. Um, so they do that in kind of some unique ways when you set it up. Um, you can also put it in Google Authenticator is, is what I do. Um, so basically, once you have Authy installed, it's very simple. There's a plus sign that you tap, and then you're ready to add a new, fact, uh, new two-factor account. 99% of them will have a QR code that you just point your phone's camera out, it scans it, and you have a new code. And then it will take you to a screen that says, hey, enter your six-digit token, and then it syncs up to your account, and you now have that extra layer of protection on your, uh, on your accounts. It's easy to use and manage once you're rolling. It just requires you to have your phone. Um, okay, and I'm so going to you know that go little meme where the head looks like it's exploding. Yeah, it's yeah. Out of it. I have some visual stuff here to go through because I figured that was going to happen. It, it's hard to explain it until you just use it. Um, the best way to think about it, like I said, is you're replacing that old little USB everybody had um, with your phone. So I have three pictures here to kind of show you what this looks like. So in the top right, this is my Authy. So these are my accounts that I have. I have all these different accounts set up to get in. I have like a million Amazon ones because I use EC2 for work, which is their cloud platform. Um, but this is really the three screens that matter. So when you're inside Authy, you see in that top right one, that add account, it's going to immediately pop up the screen to the left here, which just shows you to point your phone at the uh, QR code. Um, and you get to that QR code by when you log on to Amazon and go to set up two-factor authentication in your account settings, it's going to say, is this app-based? And when you click yes, it's going to pop a QR uh, code on your, on your screen. Inside Authy, again, you click that plus. Oops. You click that plus, you scan the QR code, and it's going to immediately make those accounts, which you can see are these icons right here. And then back on the website, it's going to ask you for your two-factor authentication. So I have Amazon Web Services popped up here in the main. 
When I was talking about the code, this is it right there. That's six digit, 070603. I'll give you this because it's long since expired. This rotates every 30 seconds. Um, an attacker, if they compromise this, they have 30 seconds to use it. And this, this is why this is so secure. It's not considered something you know, it's considered something you have because you are not gonna know that code every 30 seconds. Um, you enter it in, you click log in and you're, you're off to the races. Now this is in addition to you logging on with your password. So you log on to your password and then it's gonna ask you for your two-factor authentication. So that's when you go open up Authy, you copy it to your clipboard and you, you paste it in. Um, if you're on a desktop or a laptop and you're doing this, you just hold the phone in your hand and you type in that six digit code. You got 30 seconds, that's plenty of time. This is in addition to having strong passwords, the most secure thing. If, if you take anything from this, you already feel like you got a handle on your passwords, go through your important accounts and set up two factor. Again, some of them might not let you do the application based one and that's okay. Everything's better than nothing, but just understand this is the most secure one. So if it is available, I recommend you using it. Authy, um, like 1Password, I really like because they have a lot of tutorials to help you get started. They, they really focus on ease of use. Um, Google's is great too. It's very bare bones. It's you download the app and then it kind of expects you to know how to do all this already. Um, so Authy kind of fills that void like 1Password of getting you up to speed. Um, but Google Passwords is technically more secure because it doesn't sync. It does not have an account that syncs between all your devices. So if you just want to watch Prime on your TV, do you have to do this two-factor every time, or can you just use um, use Authy for any purchases that you do on, or, or any time that you log on to Amazon? That's a great question. The first time you set it up on like an Apple TV or Roku, it's going to ask for your two-factor, and then after that, it's going to understand that you're only using Prime. Um, how Amazon handles it is if you're buying a movie, they'll usually ask you to set up a PIN number and you have to enter that PIN when you buy a movie. So um, if, I, if I remember correctly, you will need it the first time you log into your Apple TV or Roku and then after that, you're fine. So uh, mine Prime's logged in on my Apple TV and I haven't entered it in, in five years, so. I have a question. Of course. The Authy, that's not just, so Authy isn't replacing one pass on your phone, right? Correct. It's just yeah. an additional. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's here. I can actually show you guys. So, so Authy just sits as like, can you guys see that? So it's literally just an app. And then, you know, I'm a password, so I'm not concerned. Like it, it just sits here and then you can tap on the different ones to use. So it, it's really that simple, but yes, it's in addition to your password. We're adding that second on, uh, onion layer on there. So now there's two things the attacker needs to get inside your account. And this is infinitely harder to, to get than a password because it's gone in 30 seconds. Okay, so to piggyback on what um, Mike just said, so you have one pass mm -hmm. and you have it on your computer, your phone, mm -hmm. and it's syncing. And Correct, yeah, they share between them. And then you set Authy up. Mm -hmm. And then, so is that, one password, two, two factor for all those? Uh, I'm not sure. So it, you'll have to manually set them up to add them when you can. It, Authy doesn't have any way of talking to one password if, that, if that's what you're getting at. And I apologize if I'm not getting you right. Like they're not gonna be able to sync up or it, maybe I misunderstood your question too. No, I don't, I don't think you, uh, so like if I have, one pass mm -hmm. and I go to Netflix, like he was saying, mm -hmm. go to Netflix and I'm watching it on my phone. Mm -hmm. Well, one pass is going to automatically fill that in. Correct. Now, will it go in or is Authy going to kick in and then ask me for another code? Okay, now I follow you 100%. When you log on to a lot of stuff, there's probably a little box that says, remember me. Um, right. So that's that's what that is. When you click that, that essentially puts, and again, I'm going to go a little technical, but not too technical. Okay. It essentially puts a cookie in your browser that tells the website right. that, hey, I said, leave me alone for 60 days. Okay. Um, most websites, if you click that, it's going to ask you for the two-factor the first time after you set it up. And then it's going to remember that you've 
you've trusted that device and it's going to just require a password if you haven't logged out. If you've logged out and then if you haven't logged out, it's just going to take you immediately to Netflix. But if you set up two-factor for the first time, when you re-log in, it is going to make you enter that code. The Authy code. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. It'll make you enter those to get your account set up. But that's the remember me. So if you're at home and you're on your, you know, your laptop, feel free to click. Yes, this is a trusted computer. Don't ask for my code in, for 60 days. Now, if you're at a work computer or, or um, you're at a, you know, the library, don't do that. Don't click that. Right. Link. Right. Okay. Okay. So is there really any, I'm not going to say it's not important, but I'm talking Netflix, when you're talking TV stuff, is that stuff is important because what, what are they getting through Netflix other than potentially my Southwest card number, which is attached to it, right? Which there's protection, yeah. right? So is that as important? I mean, can you do the remember me? I mean, do you have to worry about that stuff like you do? And I'm not going to even tell you where all the passwords for my life are so saved because- <laughs> They're on a Google Doc that says Shannon's passwords. No, they're not that bad, but practically. Um, I mean, are so, those are the, I mean, in the hierarchy of things, do we need to worry about Netflix? Do we need to worry about Disney Plus? So I can't answer that question for everybody, but it's again, it's it's all about where we want to accept risk because you are arguably more secure when using it, but there's going to be circumstances where it doesn't make sense for you. Um, Disney Plus, I pay through Apple. So my Disney Plus has no credit card information whatsoever. If someone got into my Disney Plus, they can watch Mandalorian on my dime and that's about it. So it, it's understanding that context. But for Prime, to the gentleman's question, Prime is tied to your Amazon account. Right. That's, a, that's a lot bigger yeah. ramifications if someone gets a hold of that. Um, and, and Netflix, same thing. Uh, if, you're, if you're logged in directly through Netflix, it's going to have your credit card information. Now that should not be stored if you log in, it should be kind of blurred out, you know, have the asterisks. Mm -hmm. They should not be able to do anything but renew or cancel your Netflix membership. They right. they would not be able to get your card from that. So yes, you're so probably you good to accept some risks. Like I know a neighbor that actually someone hacked her Google, mm -hmm. right? Got all the things and they lit she literally lost every photo that was in Google Photos, the whole nine yards. So because yep. the Google things are all attached to one another, right? Yes, correct. And that's a good point. And something I forgot to mention when we talk about what style of attacks, personal people are getting ransomware to attack. And I know you've all heard ransomware now. They steal your data, they encrypt it, and they say, hey, if you want your photos of your kids ever back, you need to pay me, you know, $2,000. That style of attack is in the, in the private sector now. Um, so that's a great point. If they get on your iCloud, your Google, guarantee they're going to steal your photos and they're going to hold your ransom for them. You should so, have a, a, a separate hard drive that has those yep. things up, right? Yeah. Or like what me and my wife do, we use iCloud and then we back them up to Google Photos. So we have them in two different buckets just in case something happens. Um, now there usually is cost associated with that with most places. It's the thing to consider there. Um, so if you if you want, you buy an external hard drive one time and you back up your photos every you know, couple months. So Hey, Greg, just to let you know, I mean, mm -hmm. this is great and I want to keep listening and I'm sure everybody else does. I do think our Zoom goes until 8.30. So okay. we have 30 minutes to kind of get through the rest of your slides. And I don't know what you have, but we don't want to miss anything that's, you know, fantastic. Okay. So. I'll move on. Um, so the one thing I wanted to talk about, and I know, Cami, this really uh, was something that enlightened you, is, is Apple Pay and Samsung Pay I get talked to a lot about. First thing I'm always asked, is it safe? Uh, it's arguably more safe than handing someone your credit card is what I always reply with. Yes, there's risk. It's Bluetooth communication. It's in, uh, NFC communication. If an attacker intercepts that, that wrist on that terminal and views that communication, then potentially your information could be exposed. But I'm going to go through some things why I think this has unique advantages. One, physical security. Um, your Apple Pay and Samsung Pay is locked behind your phone security. So if your phone's secure, your payment information is secure. Uh, it's not susceptible to skimming devices. And that's where an attacker literally inserts something into a credit card reader that pulls your information every time a credit card swipe. Um, that is how Home Depot had a lot of breach. Uh, they had skimming devices inserted into their point of sale systems. Um, last one, it doesn't, when you use Apple Pay and Samsung Pay, and a lot of people don't know this, it does not give your credit card out to the retailers. It gives a tokenized number which represents that credit card transaction and is only good for that credit card transaction. When you use Apple Pay or Samsung Pay, you are not giving your credit card number away to a retailer. 
Um, so a lot of things I'm always, when I mention this, people go, well, I don't want to give my credit card to Apple or Samsung. I go, usually I'm like, well, you're using their phone. You've probably already given it to them already and you just don't know it. But also I'm like, well, I'd rather give my credit card once to Apple than to hundreds of retailers that I use you know, throughout the course of the day. Last, a unique advantage is with COVID, you don't have to touch anything if you use Apple or Samsung Pay. Um, my watch, I just double tap it, hold it up to the Target terminal and it gives me a beep and I'm done. Um, so that's something I just wanted to touch on. I think these are good features and I think they are ones that for most people, it makes sense to use. Again, there's privacy concerns with this. If it's not for you, it's fine. It's an accepted risk. Um, when we use the chip in our credit card, that's essentially what the, that chip is trying to do as well as to add some security by uh, making it uh, not just your credit card number. There's some more tokenization going on there, but I won't get into that. What's the risk of them? intercepting you by a Bluetooth when you're tapping. So it would all be encrypted. So they would have to decode everything, like I mentioned, with password uh, cracking and, and ha dehashing techniques. And the encryption method for Samsung and Apple Pay are ridiculous. Our rig, it would take 100 years to crack. I mean, it's it's very secure. I'm just, I'm not going to tell you there's no risk associated with it, essentially. Um, the problem is, like, if if they do intercept it, what they can do is use your credit card for that single transaction. Um, but then after they use it for that, it's gone. But uh, you got to trust someone in the, in the chain of uh, you know, commerce. And, and that's where I say I've, I put my eggs in this basket because there's a lot of ifs on the Apple Pay, whereas there's a lot of easier routes if you give someone your credit card and they decide to do something uh, crummy with it. So, um, And like I said, it just offers a lot of ease of use. Um, for me as well. Um, the smart home security devices, uh, smart home security for IoT, which we hear IoT a lot, Internet of Things. So everything's connected to the internet these days. Um, that I, I say, uh, you got to treat it like a door to your house. Um, if you leave those unsecure, you are risk to the ransomware, which I mentioned, to spying or pranking. Um, the Ring doorbell had a very common issue right before COVID where kids found out how to do it on Reddit and other websites, they would sit there and try to log on to your ring with a brute force attack or people didn't change the default password and they would connect to your ring's intercom, you know, make it ring, do all kinds of stuff. They did this with the ring cameras too. This was a very common prank style of attack. Um, so the important thing here with these style devices is remember we wanna make them more secure, but more accessible. And again, this isn't to, to fear monger anybody into not using this. It's, I just wanna make sure you understand that there are some considerations with smart devices. And I made a checklist here. Whenever you're setting up a new device or maybe a device you haven't put the due diligence into yet, change any and all default passwords. The easiest way we get inside systems at organizations, um, a lot of times I start because they put a, a webcam on the teller line for banks and it's a default password. So boom, I'm, in, I'm inside their network. So now I have to do some more work to hop from that camera, so to speak, to a computer, but they've essentially left a front door wide open for me. Same thing with your house. When you get a new smart appliance and it tells you to log on with admin password, the first thing you need to go do is change that password. Because as long as you have not changed that, anyone who gets in range of those devices is gonna be able to log right into it. And they're gonna have the same access that you would when you're setting it up. Second, before you set it up and use it regularly, you need to make sure you've installed any software updates before you finalize the deployment. Um, a lot of uh, routers especially get hacked um, where they literally take control of your device and use it for crypto mining or for botnets to do other attacks because of security vulnerabilities. Um, at home, um, if you're not familiar with that process, you definitely have the power to contact your ISP and ask them, hey, is my device up to date and can you please update it? Um, so I definitely recommend you doing that. And uh, also a lot of people don't know this, if you have a multi uh, like a capability device that has a ton of different features and you don't wanna use them, turn it off. Um, if you leave them on, that just potentially exposes another way for that to be compromised. Um, and finally, uh, this really goes for anybody who lives in the city or in an apartment, don't use, public uh, don't use public networks for your smart devices. If someone is on the same wireless network as you, they can view everything you're doing if you're not going through a VPN, uh, which is kind of outside the scope of this, but you need to consider public Wi-Fi networks as not trusted networks. Uh, it's, it's essentially opening every door to your house um, in, in a very busy area, essentially, for lack of a better term. So don't use public Wi-Fi networks for your smart devices. Um, 
log out of your computer every night or is it enough to just shut the lid? Uh, lock it. Um, so it depends on what your setting is for when you shut the lid, you need to make sure it's locked. Um, if you are, if you lock your computer, so on Mac, if you hit the touch ID button on Windows, if you hit Windows L, um, that locks it. Everything, your biometric, your password, whatever you have set up needs to be entered again if you've locked your computer. Um, you don't have to turn it off if you don't want to. Uh, things are very power efficient these days. So, Okay, my husband will like, we have a bet on that. He thinks that they're all coming into my computer at night because I don't shut my computer off. No, no. I mean, it leaves the community. He, he's, you're both right. He's, he's right. That. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're good. You, you, it is fully secured when it's locked. So, um, so home routers. Use, go ahead. Don't use um, public Wi-Fi for anything? Uh, Not for anything. For So I said mostly for people device. who may live in the city. Yeah, like don't hook up your Alexa to the public Wi-Fi if you live in an okay. apartment or downtown. It, it's your just phone not a, if you're out yeah. at, at a coffee shop or something. Yeah, but be, okay. except if you're doing some business on it at a coffee shop, you right. want to make sure you have a phone VPN that your company set you up with to do that securely. So, and, and again, that's a little outside the scope, but if, if you do do a lot of business on the road, I, I would talk to your company about, hey, can I maybe get a VPN on my phone and have the IT guys help me out with setting right, that up? Right, but if you're just Googling, if you're just going out yeah. and looking at websites, you're fine. You're 100% fine, yep. Just don't so do business, yeah. So if you're at Starbucks and you log on to the free Wi-Fi, is that what you're saying? That That's probably not a great idea? Yeah, if you do that, do um, do your normal internet searching. You know, you can look at your email because that's encrypted the password, but don't do work stuff on public. Don't check your bank account probably on public uh, Wi-Fi. A trick is turn off the Wi-Fi and use your LTE. So if you have to do something urgent, that's secure. Okay. So um, the, the home routers, again, this is pretty common knowledge. A lot of people know this. It, it is the hub to all our smart devices now. Um, a lot of home routers you get from AT&T ship with a password for your Wi-Fi network on the serial label where the serial code is. Change that. Um, just like you, AT&T is susceptible to social engineering. And if they get a database of everybody's password, your password to your home router is stolen. Yes, there's a lot of hoops for them to find where you live and log on, but it, it's just good practice to change that password. Um, the other thing is routers have to be updated. I already touched on this. In 2018, there was an attack that affected 500,000 uh, out-of-date appliances. They were uh, uh, sonic wall uh, routers. Um, it, it's just important to keep those things up to date. We kind of just set them up and forget them when we, we get our Wi-Fi installed. And you need to kind of treat those as your front door, like I said. Um, this browser warning. So uh, Chrome, Safari, Firefox have done a lot to help increase your knowledge of security risks. The problem is, is they don't always do a great job explaining what those actually are. And most of my family just clicks through them. So um, I, I wanted to kind of show you uh, four of these and kind of go through them real quick. So there's a lot of information on this screen. These are four individual screenshots and I'm just gonna walk through them. So the first one is, is that Safari. If you go to a website that is known malicious, which means a bad thing has happened on this website and you see this screen, stop what you are doing and do not go to that website. You are going to get hacked. Um, that they, they make you click a box, Chrome, uh, Firefox does this too. Um, I have to do this for work. I have to go to a lot of websites with this, this screen, but obviously I have uh, the, the training to, to understand that big red screen equals just run away. That's, that's kind of what I tell my family. Um, that's the, the worst warning. So the next one is probably one you've seen quite a bit, and this is the top right. This is an untrusted certificate. Um, certificates in that top corner where it says not secure, the whole point of a certificate, and this is kind of technical and so I apologize, is for a website to prove to you who they are. Facebook has a certificate that Facebook created and was signed by a certificate authority, which is a company that is, it's basically like a notary for websites. They approve that yes, this is Facebook. So when you go to facebook.com, their certificate is valid. If you go to someone's fake Facebook that's trying to steal your password, you are going to see this screen. So if you are going to Facebook and this pops up, war warning signs. If you go to Keller Williams and this pops up, warning signs. These are signs that someone has tricked you into going to a website that it actually isn't, or something has happened that compromised the website that you're going to. Um, if you want to know more about that, just look into website certificates. There is some good entry-level information out there. It is a fairly 
complex conversation, but that's essentially what it's warning you of. Um, the bottom left here is just showing you when a website is secure and when it's not. Uh, HTTPS, those first five letters there, means your, your traffic is encrypted. So back to the guest Wi-Fi real quick. If you log on to something that's HTTPS encrypted, your password is not going to be visible if someone's viewing that traffic. It will be encrypted very securely. If you go to a website that is not secure, does not have proper encryption, if you log on to your bank account on public Wi-Fi and I have a tool running that lets me see traffic in real time, I will see your clear text password when you enter it, if it is not a secure website. So those what, what those two mean, and it's just keep an eye out for that. Um, I mentioned there's been places I don't do business with for one reasons. I There was an e-commerce website I was gonna use for a gift for someone and their login portal was not secure with a certificate. And I emailed them and said, hey, I was gonna buy you know, that sweatshirt for a friend, but I'm not gonna do it until you, you fix your website. Um, Again, it's accepting risk, understanding uh, the risk. And then this is from Cami last night. Um, so this is a new warning in Chrome, I believe, and um, some others do it too. So one password is an EXE, which is a Windows executable, which means if you run it, it will install software. A lot of browsers will make sure you understand when you are installing, uh, when you are downloading an executable. And this is good because a common way someone will trick you is they might pretend to be your bank and say, hey, we have a discrepancy with your, your account balance. Here's a screenshot. Can you open it real quick and let us know? And it's really an executable file that's gonna install a, a backdoor into your computer. So Chrome pops this up. It doesn't, always, it doesn't mean it's a virus. It's just letting you know, hey, this is an executable. Did you mean to download something that's gonna install software? So if you download one password, you're probably gonna see this pop up. If you download um, the like a, a game for your for your one of your kids or yourself, it, it's going to pop this up most likely. And it, it's it's not a virus. It's just letting you know, hey, this is software that's going to be installed. So it's very important to kind of know what those mean. Um, that's it. Um, so I hope you took away something. Um, I think we have a little bit of time left, Cami, for questions. I really stress there's no dumb or silly questions um, when I do these kinds of presentations or when I talk to family. I tell them it's sillier to not ask the questions because if you can do anything to protect yourself, um, it, it's obviously going to help you. Um, these steps too aren't silver bullets. Um, by that I mean they're not one-stop solutions. If if there was an easy solution to be more secure, I wouldn't have a job. Um, so these are all things that help you be proactive and reactive to minimize the impact of a security risk. This can happen to anybody. I've had my identity stolen and I'm very secure. Um, there's no shame with it. It's just, like I said, arming ourselves with the best tools and resources to help prevent or mitigate in any way that we can. Gotcha. We each have a, a VPN from our work that we do our work stuff on at home. And mm -hmm. if we get a VPN for home, is that going to interfere at all and cause any issues with the other two VPNs? No, it shouldn't. Um, they should all be using kind of, again, without getting too technical, but they should all be set up to talk to the VPN server on the other side that they need to, and you shouldn't have any issues. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you think buying with PayPal is safe and is Venmo safe? Like, what about those, those kind yeah. of... Yes, so uh, Venmo, PayPal, same technology, same company. Um, they are essentially using the... The big risk with those is they get inside your account, obviously, but same thing with a bank. You got to accept some risks. Um, they do the exact same thing. They do not give your bank account or your credit card to the merchant. They are essentially a middleman um, that handles the transaction and then bills you. It is basically how to think. They're very secure. Make sure you have two factors set up on them. So should you have your debit card attached to the, your Venmo? I mean, honestly, uh, one of my good friends actually had her Venmo hacked, whatever. And I, yeah. to be honest, I would rather pay the service fee from Southwest because when Aaron had two thousand dollars stuck out of her bank account, it scared the crap out of me. Yeah, so I, I don't for a credit card. I mean, I have it set up to my bank account, and it requires a ton of authentication. I don't use debit card. My debit card, I don't think I've even activated in ten years. Uh, mm -hmm. Debit cards are just a pain in the butt to if you get. Like I, my credit card was used um, in Georgia and within 20 minutes, they reimbursed me and we're handling yeah. it. Like they just make it so much easier. So, so you're basically saying 
Venmo to your credit card. So I'm saying your Venmo to your debit yeah. card. Because yeah. I'm not friends. We've Venmo each other all the time. 10 bucks, 20 bucks. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Okay, I am. And, you know, I mean, it's whatever makes the most sense to you. Just no matter what you do, it, it's arguably more secure. It's probably easier to use a credit card, but obviously not everybody has necessarily that privilege to use a credit card like that. Um, I just tie it to my bank account because it's easier, but I have every security feature enabled on my PayPal and, and Venmo that I can. But yes, they they are still in business for as long as they have been in business because they're doing a lot right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So we don't have, no, nope, we don't have any questions in our chat box because I think people were doing a great job asking along the way. Um, mm -hmm. If you have any other questions, pipe up now. Otherwise, I think we want to ask Michelle to um, let us know from our drawing who was a present, who we're going to give a one year, one password membership to. So do we have any other questions before Michelle pops on? No. I have a question. Yes. Um, received an email supposedly from Google and said that some of my passwords were compromised. I should change my passwords. Um, you know, I, I have not changed my passwords because I don't know if it's somebody looking for my new passwords. So I can tell you right now it probably is. Um, it, I would go on to your account, but go there directly. So don't click any links in the email, go to google.com, log in there and change your password is All how right. I, what I would do. Okay, thank you. Of course. So there is that thing that says these accounts have been compromised. It gives you the, that's probably phishing for me to. Yeah. 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 That's there, what you're talking there's, about. I got that too. Yeah. There's websites you can go to, to see if you've been breached. I don't want to give any through voice because I want to make sure I'm giving you an accurate um, website. Um, I can definitely shoot those to Cami, some, some safe ones for your, if you have any people that are interested in looking. You can go see, like I said, I, I pulled up that my Zynga was breached, you know, a decade ago. Um, there's definitely safe information for you to figure that out. Be great. That'd be great. Well, good. Well, Greg, you are amazing. You know, Greg. Yes. Mm -hmm. Somebody else uh, has. Gre yes, Greg. Mm -hmm. This this is Ed Conroy. I'm a friend of uh, Shannon's, and I have a question. Whenever I get an email that I'm not sure of where it's coming from, I open that email just to see the address, and it looks like an address that um, is a fake. I will immediately delete it. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it good to, to open the email or just to delete if, it if, from the beginning? If it's for work, I would say, I mentioned you probably want to check what your policy is at work because IT guys might want you to forward that to them so they can expect it, uh, so they can in inspect it. If it's personal, I wouldn't even open it. If it's not something you recognize and it's not something important, delete it. The problem is, is without getting too technical again, there's attacks we can do that will fire off if you just open an email. You don't have to click on anything. Um, this is mostly an outlook when you have to download pictures immediately for emails. I can get your password hash by if you just download some of my pictures in an email. Um, so work, forward it to IT, delete it, don't open it. At home, I'd probably still just delete it if you don't recognize it. If it's someone you're expecting to communicate with you anyway, you probably have a way to contact them and ask them if it's legit. Okay, Send thank you. Send a card in the mail. Mm -hmm. Right? What's that? Send a card in the mail. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's that's way more secure. Just takes a little bit of time. Posted stamp. Well, good. Well, M Michelle, are you there? I am. So thank you for keeping track of everybody that joined us tonight. Do you um, want to do a, I think I have to see if I can find her on here. Do you want to, you know what, Greg, I'll t if you don't mind unsharing your screen, just that would be great. So we'll just, there we go. There. Few people on. We had like 27 on, so that's pretty good for us. Thank you. So draw a name out of the bowl. Yep, so I got my bowl here. We're very tight. This is very, very <laughs> I cut pieces of paper and everything. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so. Yeah. Is there a drum roll? Da, 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 da. It was the one. Um, Kelly Glazer, is that right? 
Kelly Glazer, yes. Yay. This is oh, thank you. Thanks for joining <laughs> That's us. So awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll, thanks we'll for get that. that to you. We'll be in touch. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Greg, thank you so much. I'll be talking to you very, very soon. And for everybody that joined us, we appreciate it. I hope you hope you don't leave here thinking, my God, I'm I'm a disaster <laughs> <laughs> online. I'm thinking that myself, but um, hopefully you learn something and you'll all be safe. Appreciate yeah. you guys coming. Thanks, Greg. Thank Thanks you, helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Thanks, Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Thanks so Greg. much. Awesome. Have, a, have a good night. Bye, Judy. Yes. Good night. Yes. Very informative. Bye, Beth. Thank you. Very informative and scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, it's not meant to scare. It's meant to inform us to, to be more safe. So that's how I phrase it. But yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. That was awesome. I don't even want to tell you how I saved my stuff. <laughs> I know because I have it. I know you all. Have it. <laughs> we all know where Shannon's passwords are. Yeah. <laughs> Who am I, Shannon Dozer? Not, not for long. I think I need to take a day out of my life and just do nothing except figure out my password stuff. Yeah. Hey, it's not a, if you get a. I mean, we all have a little extra free time right now. It's probably not a bad idea to go. Yeah. Go, you know what? Okay. I'm not sure it was going live, and I'm not even sure it was recorded. But if they it's did, they, um. So. Go would live. you mind, Greg? Would you share your um, your uh, slides with me? We've got. Uh, yeah. I, okay, okay. You have them, Cami. I was trying to take notes, but woo. I yeah. I'm a former high school debater. This was slow for me. I have to physically in my <laughs> oh, head yell at myself to really slow bad. down. <laughs> You're still alive, um, Shannon. We are. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, <laughs> all right. I can't We're very techy. Mm-hmm. <laughs>